Blue tongue skinks are about as close as it gets to a reptilian puppy. I mean, they're small, they're cute, they're derpy, they're stumpy, they're basically always hungry, they go to the bathroom when you don't want them to. I mean, what more could you want? Blue tongue skinks are a great beginner reptile that I just, I can't recommend enough. I mean, they're not as small or as easy as leopard geckos or crusted geckos, but if you want a more decent sized, beginner friendly reptile that is active, engaging, just fun to own, this is one of your best picks. Just a few warnings before we get into the care guide. First off, don't let this be the only research that you do, please. Watch other care videos, read other care guides. There's surprisingly a, a, quite a few parts of blue tongue skincare that's pretty contentious. So try and learn as much as you can about one before you bring one home. And secondly, we're not gonna talk about breeding in this care guide because I am an educator. I have one blue tongue skink. I don't breed my animals. And I heard blue tongue skinks aren't that easy to breed anyway. So we're just gonna talk about how to take care of them as a pet. Blue tongue skinks are a medium sized lizard from Indonesia and Australia and there's quite a few subspecies and localities and such to them and these all do they do tend to have a minor difference on their care and their size. Indonesians like Lou here which is mostly what I'm going to be directing this care guide at these guys usually max out this is about what you can expect for an adult they usually get about 18 to 24 inches. Uh, Lou here is right around 21 I think and some do get bigger and especially the northerns if you get Australian blue tongues they usually they can even hit 30 inches in length. Like I said, Lou here is an Indonesian. I think he's a Maruki, but I'm not 100% sure. If you watch some of my other videos, I'm really not good when it comes to identifying morphs and localities and such, but the care for the Australian and the Indonesian is very similar. There's just a few differences, like the humidity and temperature and such. This chunk of a sausage lizard can be a bit of a hassle to find captive bred, mainly the Indonesian ones, because they are not the easiest to breed in captivity. So it's just easier to, and cheaper to import wild cod and farm bred ones so you will see a lot of those on the market but if you do your research you can find captive breeders with blue indonesian blue tongue skinks now australian blue tongues australia banned the export of their reptiles decades ago so there's like a 99.99 percent chance any northern blue tongues you see on the market they're going to be captive bred for price, it really depends on what type of blue tongue you're going after. Normally, if you're just going looking for a plain old Indonesian one, the common ones, they go for two to three hundred dollars, which is a more serious investment than bearded dragons. But personally, I find these way more engaging and fun to keep because they're always on the move. They have a lot of personality. They love moving around outside and such, whereas bearded dragons, for the most part, just kind of sit there. If you're looking for an Australian blue tongue skink, like a northern, then you're probably paying minimum five to six hundred dollars which is a heftier price tag like double or triple but there are actually parts of northern blue tongue skin care that are probably a bit easier for people to manage than the indonesians like humidity but we'll talk about that more in a later section being a decent sized lizard blue tongues need a fairly big enclosure and there's a couple different options for you to consider first off are just glass tanks aquariums because you can find them everywhere pet stores amazon craigslist you can find them new used you might even be able to get some for free if you're lucky now with these guys previously like historically it would be very very common to see care guides saying 40 gallon tank is fine for a blue tongue for its entire life. I think that's a little small. The next size up will be a 55 gallon tank, which is four foot long, which is good, but it's only a foot wide, which is kind of narrow for a lizard that can get two, two and a half feet long. So the size up after that, the 75 gallon tank is usually what I recommend as a minimum for a blue tongue skink. It's got, I think it's four foot by two foot in dimensions. I don't remember off the top of my head, but it is bigger than the 55 gallon tank. Now the next size up after that, if you want to keep going up, you want to get a 125 gallon tank, 175 gallon tank. You can, if you want, if you want to spend the money go for it because blue tongue skinks the more ground space you give them they will use it the next options are going to be pvc or wood enclosures and these are very nice because they are very customizable you can get them in basically any size you want it's just you either have to have the material or the tools to do it yourself or you're gonna have to find someone to build it for you and there's a bunch of people online on facebook or even if you go to reptile expos and stuff you will find a lot of people that build these enclosures it's just gonna be a bit pricier now with those wood there's a couple caveats to it one wood is very heavy and if you get a decent sized enclosure for this lizard it's gonna be quite a few pounds so it's gonna be harder for yourself to move also wood you have to seal the entire inside of the enclosure blue tongue skinks especially the indonesians need a good bit of humidity and that moisture would just make the wood rot so if you are getting a wood enclosure you have to make sure you seal every inside inch 
of that interior. Whereas with PVC enclosures, you don't have to worry about that because PVC, it's plastic. It's not going to rot or mold or anything. You just have to seal the seams really well to keep the moisture from seeping outside of the corners of the cage. And also PVC is going to be a lot lighter. For juveniles and smaller blue tongue skinks, I would say a minimum six square feet of floor space should be good. It's three foot by two foot, which is a very common size that a lot of these companies that build these enclosures do. Lou here, he's kind of on the smaller end. Like I said, he's about 20 inches, if that. So I have him in a three foot by two foot by two foot. A lot of the enclosures you see online in the size, they're going to be three foot by two foot by one foot height. But I mean, if you talk to him, you can get a custom height usually, no problem. I have this extra height for him because A, he's a bit of a burrower. So it lets me give deeper substrate for him to dig in. And it also helps with humidity. For your big blue tongue skinks, like your 30 inch Northern Australian blue tongues, or if you have a really big Indonesian, I would say the minimum should be four foot by two foot. So eight square feet of floor space. The last option I'm gonna quickly talk about are standalone plastic tubs. Now, these are very nice because they're very cheap. You can find them at Walmart, Home Depot online very easily. Now you're gonna need a really big one, like the dimensions of the enclosures I just talked about with four foot by two foot or three foot by two foot, something like that. It'll hold humidity really well. It's just you're gonna have to customize it yourself. You're gonna have to cut out holes and find ways to uh, like attach the heating units and all that stuff. And it's plastic, so it might be a fire hazard. So there are a few precautions you need to take with it, but you can make it work. I'm not gonna talk about it a whole lot because I've never done it with blue tongues, but go on Google, you'll find other people that can guide you. For bedding, there are some that work really well. There are some that get the job done and there's some that do not work. The first ones, the very bad ones, straight sand. Now, even though you're, especially your Australian blue tongue skinks, they come from very hot, semi-arid areas. They're not just found on sandy, deserts or anything like that. It's unrealistic. So just don't do this, especially that crappy calci sand, because that's very dangerous for reptiles. It's killed a lot of reptiles. So straight sand, just don't do it. Also certain wood chip beddings like cedar and pine. Now we'll talk about aspen more in a second, but cedar, they found it's not even good for small mammals like hamsters, which it's designed for. And pine, there's oils in it and stuff that's just not good for reptiles. So just be sure to avoid those ones. Now for ones that get the job done, newspaper and paper towel, very easy to clean, very easy to sanitize, to take the whole thing out and replace it, but these are burrowers. They have sharp nails, so they will most likely shred it and move it all around and everything. And they might poop under it anyways and stuff. So it, it can be a little bit of a hassle to keep clean. And there's also reptile carpet. Now reptile carpet, that green mat that you'll put in tanks and stuff. I don't know if they make one for something this size. So you might have to get a couple different ones and overlap it. I might be wrong. I mean, this is nice because you can take it out and hose it out outside, but even after doing that for a while, it still eventually will build up a smell. So you'll have to replace it anyways. So you're probably just better off going with newspaper if you're gonna go this kind of direction. And then there's also aspen bedding, which is a wood shaving bedding. It's very popular with colubrid snakes. I use it for a lot of my snakes. And I have heard of people keeping blue tongue successfully on it. It's just, I mean, it holds burrows really well, but ultimately it is a wood shaving bedding, especially when you have Indonesians that need higher humidity, it might mold. Actually, no, it probably definitely will mold. So it is something that you're gonna have to look out for if you do wanna go the Aspen route. Your best choices, in my opinion, are loose substrates that are gonna hold humidity well. So like cypress mulch, eco earth, cocoa husk, all these things, they're very easy to find online or at reptile expos. They all hold humidity really well, so they're not gonna mold on you. And they're all very good for blue tongues digging down into them. And the last option is what I do. It's a mix of just plain old topsoil and washed play sand. You can find it at any garden store, Home Depot, places like that. And it's very cheap. You can get it for a couple bucks a bag. And you're gonna mix this together. And I use a ratio, I think like 60% soil, 40% sand. And it holds burrows really well, holds humidity really well. I use this honestly, I think for almost all of my lizards, my leopard gecko, my blue tongue, my beardies, my monitors, my tagus. You just mix the ratio of how much sand and soil there is. Now with this, you because it's not reptile specific branded, it's just meant, it's just at Home Depot and garden stores, you will have to sift through it because every once in a while you get little bits of plastic and stuff in there. And it's also good for bioactive enclosures, which blue tongues are actually an excellent candidate for. You just put some leaf litter and moss on top of it. You can add some springtails and isopods as your cleanup crew, put some live plants in there. It works perfectly, as you can see with mine right here. For Indonesian blue tongue skinks, you're gonna want a cool side in the high 70s to low 80s, a warm side in the high 80s to low 90s, and then a basking temperature right around 95 to 100 degrees, I would say would be the absolute maximum. You do not want it going over 100. You wanna give them this temperature gradient because reptiles don't regulate their own body temperature. They rely on their environment. So you wanna give them a couple different temperatures so they can move around and warm up or cool off as they need to. And also these are just 
these are just ranges. These are just not, I mean, these aren't, it's not a specific science, okay? It's not like if your basking temperature is 94 degrees or your cool side is at 83 or 84 degrees, your blue tone's gonna just keel over and die. These are just ranges. It's not a specific science. It's not light for death. If you're off by a handful of degrees, it, it's not the end of the world. And at night, they're fine if the temperature cools off. As long as it's above 70 degrees, you're fine. For measuring the temperature, you're gonna wanna get a good thermometer. You can get one of those digital ones with a probe. You can get this one right here that I use that's used for houses. You wanna avoid those crappy little stick-on ones that you can see at pet stores and stuff because those don't work, they're very inaccurate. You also could use a temp gun, which is very handy. It's basically like a little laser gun. You point it at a surface and it tells you the exact temperature of that surface, not like the air temperature. And that's very handy for a blue tongue skink because as you can see, they spend a lot of their time in direct contact with the ground. Indonesian blueies like the humidity right around 60 to 80% with that sweet spot in the middle of 70% being ideal. And if you have the right type of enclosure, this is very easy to manage like a PVC or a plastic bin. If you have a big open 75 gallon tank with a mesh lid, you can still regulate it. It's just, you're gonna need to cover almost all the lid and tin foil or saran wrap to help trap that humidity inside. For Australian blue tongues, they like their humidity a bit drier, something like 35 to 50. 45% and this is very easy for anyone to manage. It's actually kind of like resting room humidity for a lot of areas as long as you're not in the tropics. So in this regard, again, blue, northern blue tongues do tend to be a little bit easier than the Indonesians. Now with the Indonesians, I mist blue probably every two to three days and it's not a super intense heavy misting. I just kind of give a quick misting on the plants and some of the moss and stuff just to kind of help boost the humidity. And you don't want the humidity high all the time. You don't want it 80 to 100% all the time. That'll lead to respiratory infections and such. You want it, when you mist, it's going to spike the humidity up to like 80, 90, 100%. As time goes on, it'll just taper off naturally, which is fine. Cause again, as long as it's going back down to that range you want, then that's fine. And also just like with thermometers, you need a good hydrometer to measure humidity. You can get a good digital one with a probe, which is very handy. You also can get ones like the one I showed you that combines heat and humidity. It measures both. So this is very nice to look at. What you do want to avoid, just like with thermometers, are those crappy cheap little tack on ones because these are really bad. They're very inaccurate to say the money. With this being a diurnal lizard, heat from above tends to just work best. Your under tank heat options like under tank heaters, heat tape, they're not gonna do a whole lot, especially if you have a few inches of substrate. So above heaters work. Now the most popular one is going to be heat lamps with a heat bulb. You just get a bulb the right wattage. With these guys normally like 75 to 100 watts probably and you just screw it in the lamp, you're good to go. Now if you have a tank, 75 gallon tank with a mesh lid, very easy, you just take the lamp, rest it on the lid, that's all there is to it. Now with PVC or wood enclosures, you need to either have like a socket on the inside, like you can see with Lou right here, that I can just screw the bulb into, and I don't ever have to worry about him getting up to it, honestly. Other lizards I would, but not him. Or you could also, as you can see right here, you have a hole cut out in the PVC or wood or whatever, you put mesh down on top of it so you can rest the lamp there. Radiant heat panels are another good option. It's basically a thin, long plastic box that you're going to mount with screws to the inside of your enclosure. Obviously this works best with PVC and wood. You can't really do it with glass tanks with mesh lids, but you're going to mesh mount it in there. Now with these, you're going to want to run it with a thermostat. So you plug this into the thermostat because you don't want this heat panel going on full blast all the time. So with the thermostat, you plug into the thermostat. Thermostat will have a little probe that you're going to snake into the enclosure. You put it on the ground underneath where the radiant heat panel is going to be putting heat onto. And with this, if it gets too hot, it'll kick off. If it gets too cold, it'll kick back on because on the thermostat, you can set what temperature you want it to. So you need need one of these if you're gonna get a heat panel. The last heat source I'm gonna quickly talk about are ceramic heat emitters. It's basically a bulb that just kicks off heat, not light. So it's very good for nighttime heat, except these suckers burn real hot. So you're gonna to need to doubly make sure that the blue tongue has no way to get to it. Again, if you're using a 75 gallon tank with a mesh lid, it's very easy to just put this on the lid. But if you're using a PVC or a wood enclosure, I wouldn't really recommend this one because you need a whole other separate socket or something. So you're probably just better off going with a radiant heat panel if you really do need that extra heat. Now this is surprisingly the most contested part of blue tongue skink care. There are a bunch of keepers out there that successfully keep their blue tongue skink without a UV light. And when we think of diurnal basking lizards like iguanas, bearded dragons, we always think, okay, they need a UV light. They need that UVB. But with blue tongues, we found that they don't necessarily exactly need it. They do get by, they do survive without it. Now on the flip side of that, there's a bunch of keepers that do give their blue tongue skink. He's trying to eat my phone off camera. <laughs> but there's a bunch of keepers that do give UV light to their blue tongues. And there are studies showing that blue tongues do benefit somewhat from it. It's just with bearded dragons and iguanas, 
they need the UV light. If they don't get the UV light, they die. Whereas blue tongues, we found that they don't die if they don't have it. They survive and they can even thrive with or without UV light. Now there's two different options for UV. What I use is called a mercury vapor bulb. It's a special bulb that combines heat and UV. So as those basking lizards are sitting under those bulbs, they're getting the UV rays as well. Now there's also out there those these little coil bulbs. You can get them at pet stores for like 15 to 20 dollars. Save your money. These are crap. They don't really give off any UV. The pet store people, other people will tell you otherwise. It's a waste of money. Now luckily with a blue tongue, if you do give this, you're just wasting your own money because there's no UV benefiting the lizard, but it's not going to kill the lizard. Whereas if you got that for like a bearded dragon, you'd have a dead bearded dragon. Because the bulbs that I recommend, like Zoom Ed Power Suns, the Mega Ray bulbs, these are all gonna be in the 40 to $70 range. And the UV bulbs, they do expire at some point. You will have to swap them out, which a lot of people don't realize. They stop emitting UV normally like 10 to 12 months into their lifespan. The light will still be on. It's just, there won't be any more UV rays. So that is something you're gonna have to be aware of. You are gonna have to swap these out like annually. The other option is going to be a tube UV light. Now there's a couple different brands. There's Reptisun from Zoomed, there's Arcadia, quite a few ones for you to choose different lengths and everything. With these, you're gonna have to get a special fixture obviously for them because you can't just screw it into a regular dome heat lamp like you could with the mercury vapor bulbs. And they also give off no heat, it's just UV. So if you do get this, you are going to need to get a separate heat source. And these are going to expire, if you get the T5s, they're gonna expire every year, just like the regular mercury vapor bulbs. But if you get a T8, the thicker ones, you're gonna to need to do it every six months. So again, I'm not gonna tell you exactly like use UV, don't use UV because there are other care guides and plenty of people on YouTube that use both UV and don't use UV and you can see how healthy their lizards are. I mean, Lou here is an example of that. In my opinion, if you're gonna spend the two to $300 on the lizard, if you're gonna buy the expensive setup and everything for it, you might as well tack on the extra 40 to 50 bucks, get the UV light. I mean, it can't hurt. <laughs> This is a very adventurous, curious sausage lizard. So you're gonna to wanna to give them a bunch of different things to climb under and climb over and climb on and such in the enclosure. Now they are terrestrial, so you don't need to worry about like really tall branches or anything like that. They're not gonna climb on those, but you can give them a variety of different logs and barks. You wanna give them two different hides minimum, one on the cool side and one on the warm side. You can use these reptile branded caves. You can use pieces of cork bark or cork rounds. Uh, even just a plastic container flipped over will work fine. And as I mentioned before, you can use live plants with your blue tongue skink. Now, you're gonna have to be kind of careful because you're gonna need sturdy ones because they do like to test it. So you're gonna need like snake plants or pothos or something, something that they just don't completely destroy and uproot can put up with Beardy's somewhat solid body and very strong, sharp little claws. And also my blue tongue is never nipped or anything on any of the plants, but I have heard stories of some eating plants, some, some of the plants in their enclosure, taking a bite out of it or something. So you wanna make sure you're not using anything that's toxic to reptiles. Now, if you go to a reptile expo and stuff and you buy plants, you're gonna be okay. But if you're gonna buy plants from like Home Depot or something, you might wanna research a little bit, find out what plants are, I'm not gonna say that in this video, but look up what plants are safe and not for your reptile. You're gonna want a decent sized water bowl because a bigger water bowl means more humidity in your enclosure. And you can get, a, there's a couple different ones. You can get dog bowl if you want. You can get those reptile branded bowls that look like rock caves and things. Kind of a waste of money in my opinion. But what I did, and it doesn't look as nice, but I just got a flatter rectangular plastic container that Luke can just fit his entire body in if he wants. It's really not that high up. I've seen him drink from it. I've seen him sit in it. So it works out very well for him. I have well water, so I know my water is safe, but if you're worried about your water quality, there's a few things you can do. First off, you can get uh, chemicals like Reptise Safe, which is just gonna be something you add to your water and will get rid of chlorine or whatever else inside of it. Another option, if you just want like a free home remedy is you get a milk jug, empty milk jug, fill it up with water, leave it out overnight, with the cap off because chlorine will naturally evaporate up out of water over like a 24 hour period. So you're left with chlorine free water that you can add to your reptiles, which if you don't want to do it this way, that's fine. You don't have to. It's just kind of my little quick home remedy for it. Blue tongues are true omnivores and will eat or maybe try to eat just about anything that they can in front of them. Like Lou just tried nomming on my phone not that long ago off camera. And this is another difference between these guys and Beardies that make them a bit easier in my opinion. Beardies, you have to worry about ratios a lot and they're very dramatic. When you have a little Beardie, that thing's gonna be eating almost solely bugs, but by the time you have an adult Beardie, it's gonna be needing to eat mostly plants, like 80% greens and 10, 20% bugs, which can be, sometimes they're not so wanting to do that. It can be hard to switch them over. Blue tongues on the other hand, 
It's not quite 50-50, but the ratios never change extremely. When they're younger, they will need a little bit more protein, but by the time you have an adult blue tongue, you're looking at like 40% protein, 50% greens and veggies, and 10% fruit. So it's much easier to manage. For protein, the most obvious source is just bugs. There's a bunch of different ones. You can get roaches, superworms, snails, earthworms, crickets, etc. Feed them as many as they'll eat in about five or so minutes. Another source of protein that's very popular is dog and cat food. Now there's a few caveats with this. You don't wanna feed dry kibble, like you can't just get a bag of dry dog food, that doesn't work. You're gonna to need to do wet canned food, dehydrated food, or raw food. You also don't wanna do a ton of it. I would still say whole prey, the bug should be the main protein source, but this is a nice thing to add variety and you can mix it into the salad and stuff. And also it's nice because a lot of them have some vitamins mixed into it. So it's just a little vitamin kick that's extra for them. If you're using wet canned food, you wanna make sure it's a high quality and also grain free. Now these are a couple brands that I recommend. I personally use Earthborn cat food and I use all the different flavors. Lou goes absolutely nuts for it. For dehydrated food or frozen raw food, your best bet is nature's variety. They really are the best brand in this market. You could also do the occasional pinky mouse or quail egg. Lou is a huge fan of both, but they're not exactly the healthiest protein source. So I would say only do this once or twice a month max. For the non-protein food sources, you're gonna get a good mix of healthy greens. So collard greens, dandelion, mustard, turnip, uh, escarole, endive. You can get spring mix that, that come in the pre-made packages from grocery stores. And then also there's a whole bunch of different veggies you can use like squash, there's green beans, pumpkin, cucumber, peas. There's a bunch of them. If you go online, you'll find entire pages worth of all the different fruits and vegetables that you can feed your blue tongue ranked on the most healthy to ones that should only be offered occasionally. So I'm not gonna go over all of that in this video. Those are just some of the ones that I use. So there's a bunch of different ones out there if you wanna look. And then with fruits, these are these are a big favor to lose, but like I said, 10% of the diet, you don't want a whole lot of them. So berries like raspberries, strawberries, blueberries. There's also melon like watermelon, cantaloupe. You got kiwis, mangoes, papayas. Again, just like the veggies, bunch of different options. The ones you really need to avoid are citrus fruits like oranges and pineapple and stuff because they just can't handle the acidity. And then also avocado. Never feed avocado to reptiles. It's toxic to them. For baby blue tongues like under three months of age, I would say you're gonna wanna feed every day and they do need a little bit more protein at this age. So I would say probably four days of the week, you're gonna wanna do bugs and then the other three days, salad days with fruits and vegetables and cat food or however you wanna break it up. And then for juveniles, like four to six months and then all the way up to about a year of age, I would say you're gonna wanna feed every other day, probably alternating bugs with salad day. As an adult, you wanna feed just twice a week. Trust me, Lou would eat every single day if I let him, but then he'd be super overweight. And normally earlier in the week, like Monday, Tuesday, I'll do bug day with a mix of dubia roaches and superworms. And then a few days later, Thursday, Friday, I'll do salad day with a mix of fruits, greens, veggies, and cat food. The last thing for diet is supplementation. There's two different types of calcium powder. You've got calcium with D3 and calcium without D3. Now, if you have a UV light on your blue tongue skink, you will want the calcium without D3 because they're already getting the D3 from the UV light. You do not need to give them more. There is such a thing as giving too much D3. It can be a bad thing in their system. You can still give calcium with D3. You just want to do it maybe one or two dustings a month. You don't want to do a whole lot of it. Now with Lou, I actually dust both of his meals each week. I dust a little bit heavier on the bugs. I make sure they're a little bit more calcium coated before I feed them to him. The salad, I usually just sprinkle a little bit in there, but I still add it for both feedings. If you have a young blue tongue skink, you're probably want to do the dusting every other day. And lastly, there's also a multivitamin powder that you can use if you want. Now, some people argue you don't really need it because if you have a good dog or cat food, they're getting vitamins through this, but I do it for one or two dustings a month. I usually do it every other week for the salad. Again, just like the calcium, I just sprinkle a little bit in the salad. As you can see, this is a very handleable lizard. He has just been chilling out in my hands and on the table. And uh, this is what he's like when I take him to shows. He is a very, very good education animal. He's probably been head held or pet by thousands of kids by this point. Now, just like with any reptile, there's a few caveats because A, just like lizards, he has surprisingly sharp little nails. They do kind of dig in a little bit if I go more than a couple weeks without trimming them. So I do trim his nails, but that's just something to look out for. Also, and he's never really done it on me much, but he does have a tendency to pee sometimes when my volunteers hold him. He's only done it a couple times on me, but again, it's just, it's just a little pee. These are not like deal breaking things. It's not like iguana claws or it's like not like a giant.
giant lizard unloading a poop on you or anything like that. When you first start working with them, they might be very squiggly and wiggly, sure. They might be trying to get out of your hands and slide back to the ground or something like that. But I mean, it just takes patience and time. Just when you first start handling your lizard, and when you bring it home, give it a couple weeks to settle in and eat and poop and everything. Make sure it's doing okay before you start trying to handle and work with it. But I mean, the first couple times, just keep your handling sessions short. Just let them kind of run through your hands. And eventually, I mean, I have worked with a lot of blue tongues over the years. I've never met a mean one. I mean, I'm sure there are some out there, but for the most part, they tend to just be kind of happy-go-lucky. Again, this is for the most part. I'm sure there's exceptions. Now, sometimes when I go to get Lou out, he is a little huffy. He does hiss up and everything at me, but I, as soon as I pick him up, this is just, he's just he's just a puppy dog. So it's just kind of a like, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? And then you pick him up. He's like, oh, okay, we're doing this. So again, it's just patience and time. That's really the most things I can recommend to you. And also don't hold him over your lap if you're worried about getting peed on. So that was my care guide on the blue tongue skink. It was surprisingly a very requested one. I get asked a lot about blue tongue skink care questions. So hopefully you found it useful. Thank you to our amazing patrons for supporting the channel. If you'd like to do that, link will be down below. It means a lot to me. Like the video if you learned something and comment down below if you have a blue tongue skink because honestly, this is one of my favorite species of reptile that I keep because they are just that fun. But anyways, thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you later.